good morning or good night, I suppose, for some of the uh, people who are looking in tonight. Um, welcome to the last of the Group 1 parallel sessions of this uh, Directions in Legal Education conference. And um, we've had some great sessions over the last two days. It's been an excellent conference. Uh, I've enjoyed all of the sessions that I've been to um, and taken lots of notes, learned lots of things from all of you. So thank you very much for making it such a great conference. Um, tonight, the last session, uh, we have some very good speakers for you as well. Unfortunately, I'm in there as well, but we have some very good speakers for you apart from me. Uh, the first speakers, we have three together. Um, I should really, I think, introduce the, the ladies first. Uh, so we have Miss Vanessa Wong, who is a JD candidate and the co-principal supervisor of the CUHK Medic Law um, uh, Research Project. Uh, she holds a master's degree in comparative literature from the University of Hong Kong. I should have just said another place. Her research interests include the international comparison of the regulations of medical practice, and she is a recipient of the HKSAR government scholarship. Uh, the other uh, lady involved in this particular presentation is Miss Christine Chan. She again is a JD candidate with CUHK Law and again co-supervisor of the CUHK Medic Law um, Research Project. She holds a degree in social sciences uh, with first class honours from the University of Hong Kong and she has over 10 years of professional experience in public administration. She's also a recipient of the JD Scholarship for Academic Excellence. So we have two of our students who have been working with one of my colleagues. So. Um, I should introduce my colleague, Mr. Arthur Lee, who is a practicing barrister and a teaching member of the Faculty of Law at CUHK. He has a strong interest in claims involving personal injuries and unjust enrichment. He is uh, regularly briefed to prosecute as well as defend a wide range of offences. And he is again the co-principal supervisor on the CHK Medic Law Project. So I think Arthur is here and I think Vanessa and Christine are here as well. I should just add, by the way, um, that Arthur is a very, very keen, yes, I can see everyone waving, so it's lovely to see. Arthur is such a keen teacher. Um, I'm afraid, I hope Arthur doesn't mind me sharing this. One of my jobs is to allocate teaching in the faculty. And Arthur is the first of my colleagues who's ever asked for extra teaching. So I'm not sure if that means that you, you need some sort of help, Arthur, but thank you very much for doing that. Let me hand over to Arthur and the team. Hi, good evening. Uh, can I be heard? Okay, and I suppose everyone can, can see the, the screen, yes? Okay, uh, good evening or morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Arthur Lee, and uh, we are the three of us here uh, to uh, tell you guys a, a bit about our project. So uh, it's called Medic Law. Uh, and we, we, we got a university funding to do this project. So our, our focus is to um, do interdisciplinary learning okay, between law and medicine, uh, which will also cover public health and legal education. So uh, as Stephen very kindly introduced us, so Arthur and then we have Vanessa and Christine, who are two of the current students okay, of, of my issue. What we have, uh, what we're doing today, okay, is to tell us how we have uh, went through this project and uh, how we can uh, go through it, learning beyond lectures, and then also a few students will tell us about uh, what what process they went through uh, in going through their interdisciplinary thinking. So one of the major outputs in our in our project. It is a website and you can uh, see that small screen over there and you can see the URL. It's, um, it, there's a lot of Chinese content, of course, because um, our, our goal is to outreach and have more impact in uh, the society. So of course, we, what, the main thing we're doing in this website is to we, we try to uh, write articles on certain topics that could be relevant or, or of, of interest to the general public. So of course, uh, in order, I think, or we think, to have a better impact, uh, it might be good to also have this in Chinese and written uh, in layman language, so suitable for other, the general public as well. And on the left, you can see uh, 
the topics that we try to focus on, okay, so the, the three main ones would be medical treatment. Uh, so beyond just the traditional um, medicine or medical law um, syllabus, okay, so it's also public health and international law, so it's more about that, and also public health. Now, why did we um, choose to do this? Uh, one goal we have okay, is to reassert the necess necessity of bringing law and medicine beyond the traditional meaning of education. Why, why med medicine or medical law is, uh, I think as far as I, uh, I'm aware, there's no existing uh, course on our syllabus that focuses, uh, that teaches med uh, medical law and within the law faculty. And even uh, we've tried to look at the, the me medical faculty, it is, is, again, there's no uh, focus or heavy course on this subject. So we, we think this might be a, a gap that we can fill. Uh, in line with the university theme, so Chinese U, uh, I think every five years would, would have a five-year development theme. Okay, and the, the one we're talking about now is the one that has been announced, I think, last year. So uh, last thing I do, uh, 2020, 2020 to 2025. One of the themes that we are trying to give effect to is to serve the needs and demands of the community for lifelong education and continuing development. Okay, so that, that, that is also a goal we're doing, and we want this project to continue even after our funding expires. In the uh, realm of teaching and learning, okay, uh, one thing, okay, another, another main, main goal is not just for a uh, professor or teacher to apply for a learning grant and do some research and put some output, but also to engage postgraduate students as partners Okay, in teaching development through designing learning materials and video making. Okay, so it's not just the traditional lecture one-on-one -on -one method, okay, but to give some to empower our students, okay, to also to also take a uh, part in, in this project, to interact with uh, medical legal students and also practitioners. That, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so beyond our two JD students, okay, we also try to uh, recruit other students, okay, uh, not just these two, but some from law faculty and some from, I think, the uh, psychology department also, to share our vision and values for education that would nurture them as lifelong learners and global leaders. Okay, so now, what challenges have we faced in, in the past year? The main one, I think everyone can see, uh, can predict is the pandemic situation, especially in Hong Kong, where the government has uh, well imposed very strict uh, um, guidelines on a prohibition of gathering. So we uh, there, there are many restrictions on social distancing measures. So we try to or we plan to okay, to have more meetings or interviews or even holding conference conference or seminars. Uh, or talks to uh, the medical practitioners, okay, or maybe legal, maybe also the legal practitioners, but that uh, proved to be um, impossible, okay? especially when the pandemic situation in Hong Kong uh, had waxed and wane throughout the year. So it's difficult or impossible to plan even what's going to happen in two months' time. Okay, so those of the GLC at the point of view, and also, okay, the, the our intended, okay, um, um, audience and, and speakers themselves, they are preoccupied with combating the pandemic. Uh, therefore, it would not be practical to engage them as we originally originally planned through organizing lectures or scholarly work. So, so we had to adjust our plan So part of um, planning how we are going to go through this project, uh, we have well, uh, referred to several articles. Uh, one, this, one, one, one of the main ones that we found very helpful was this one by Professor, uh, I think, Anna North. Uh, I hope I'm doing justice to his name. So the, uh, 
that there was a list of interactive teaching methods that we thought were, would, would be uh, good for us to, to jump onto. So one is the project-based learning method. So rather than any uh, general um, or just going through or like teaching general law to the public. So of course our focus here is to latch on to the medical law topic. Okay, and from that we have a website and we have a lot of uh, videos okay, on, on the website, uh, as you'll see. We try to adopt the case method. So again, not like our traditional lecture that is we just follow a syllabus and go through each topics. Rather, we have tried to look at the particular issues that are of interest and are, let's say, problematic. Okay, that so we try, let's say, medical negligence. Okay, and we go, so we focus on this issue. And from that, we have researched and written articles on it. Okay, so, and also, one thing is debate, okay, another is debate, which is, it, it's not just, um, again, one, one way giving up information, but then there might be controversial issues, okay, maybe uh, with, uh, let's say, doctor patient relationship, maybe uh, the merit of, um, of taking vaccines or, or otherwise. Okay, so there are, there are articles written by our, by our students okay, are, 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 are giving both views on, on uh, this issue. Because we uh, could not um, organize a conference that we wanted, so another way that we uh, try to give a public presentation of the project is we uh, we were invited uh, to give a show over radio. Okay, I think Vanessa will tell us give us more detail about that, uh, which I think aired for uh, two weekends. Okay, and of course this conference is another way for us to disseminate our, our uh, the output of our of, of of what we're doing of our project. And finally, brainstorming. Um, so we have. Again, involve not just uh, our two JD law students, but also students from other under this disciplines, okay, and how to exchange views and and uh, on these topical issues. Okay, achievements. This is what what we like to think we have done. So, ex again, especially for, for our two students, they have actually promoted medical law and cultivated their pedagogical abilities through alternative means. Okay, so not just the traditional methods, but now we've tried to use our project website, our radio interviews, uh, our webinars that are, are soon to go up, and also through social media. So we have, we also have, a, I think, Facebook page. Soon to have. So soon to have one, yes. Yes, and again, not, if this project is not really led by me so <laughs> so I, i've just supervised the students but they took a lot of the initiatives in learning across diverse legal fields so it's my time to share with you more about the interdisciplinary thinking my name is vanessa it's nice to see you all here so i i believe that it is probably uh less uncommon that legal scholarship has become interdisciplinary and there has been extensive scholarship on using the interdisciplinary approach of learning law. So however in this conference I fine-tuned the word interdisciplinary approach to interdisciplinary thinking because I I believe that and hope to showcase the ability to develop to consider multiple perspectives is important, especially if our audience are medical students and practitioners. And then also it is important for us to analyze different perspectives as to integrate the insight to provide a mutual benefit and experience. So how can we achieve that? I refer to uh, the research by Borman and Harris in 2019, explained the benefit of knowledge transfer which is a useful cognitive principle 
for legal education. Steer must encode and move information from working memory, we call WM, to long-term memory, RTM. However, it is important to note that students should have sufficient background knowledge to contextualize an issue. For example, um, it is plainly difficult for to talk about legal duties of medical practitioner without knowing the law. So in that case, medicine students should have the knowledge of court. And how can we merge two disciplines together? These can be achieved by invite, inviting students to organize materials during their research period, which in turn give meaning to content. And I'm going to present a chair out thinking process in the next slide, so it's not new. So as an example, there are three branches that medicine student may want to know. First of all, is the COVID-19 public health measure and judicial review. And the second is medicine and international humanitarian law, which is the international law relating to conduct of person, person, medical personnel. So the meaning of medical personnel in armed conflicts are different from the meaning of medical practitioner in hospital. And also um, students should know that what kinds of situation they may lost their protection status from an armed conflict. So um, the next one, what we think about is the public health and social justice, justice concept. And regarding this part, we are basically focusing on the scope of um, right to health and the difference between human rights and medical efforts. So do doctors should always remember confidentiality when handling patients' records. However, when it comes to um, human rights and social justice, they have to disclose the information to the court when required and necessary. They should know what's the difference between human rights and medical efforts. And what I find the most intriguing is the part about the public health measure and administrative law. In Hong Kong currently at this moment, I believe that there are four cases related to public health measure, including two of them from the, uh, about the quarantine period and places. And another one is listed on the slides is about vaccine pass and compulsory mask wearing in public place. And internationally, I selected two, um, two countries out of the 42 countries I researched. So the first one is related to the um, beaches in South Africa, that um, the court in South Africa, which the judgment um, is quoted here, finds out that it is unconstitutional um, for the beach to be closed. And the second one is uh, in Brazil, talking about um, the announcement by the president there to order the removal of lockdowns were reviewed by the court. So these are what public health medicine and epidemiologists would like to further know more in, in, a, in area of law. While doctors are trying to treat us when we are sick, and the public health professional are trying to prevent us from getting sick in the first place. And as Arthur previously mentioned that we were invited gratefully to radio interview at Metro Finance, which is one of the um, three major radio stations in Hong Kong. So um, in that program, I was asked about the information I just shared with all of you. And why is it related to heat this size here? Because Arthur provides me immediate feedback, which I realized that he is using the method um, introduced by Borman and Hara in their research on practice and feedback. They believe that practice and feedback has strong influence on learning. And we have to be make sure that um, it has to be immediate instead of after a certain period of time. 
instead of um, praising and punishing, um, which is considered unhelpful, whatever Mr. Lee is doing is trying to uh, provide clear information and lead to oh, how you can present your argument or your points to the general public in the sense that they understand. And why I feel this is um, benefit, this is beneficial because um, to me as a student who, who, who is setting my goal, uh, to be a very thorough professor Gallagher also noticed, um, it equipped me how to present the knowledge of my instructing solicitor and client differently. For example, if I'm trying to explain what is paid out to my client and to my solicitors, it will be different. I, I, I would just say, uh, or shall we consider the leave and standing and what grants to review to my solicitors? But I won't do that to my client. I would just ask them where they have sufficient interest and explain the reason instead of using those technical terms. And by, um, by these types of, of presentations and practice and feedback, I believe that um, practice and feedback are really useful when students are having their, um, their practice in front of a group of new people they do not know. And I also personally believe that medicine and law are sometimes complementary and paradoxical, especially um, on what I just mentioned on social justice about the human rights and us medical ethics on the public nationality. And I believe that Ms. Christine Chan would like to share with you more about confidentiality. So thank you, Ms. Chan. Thank you, Kaneta. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Christine, and it's my great pleasure to share more insights with you all about our project and how we try to reach out to the public. So um, moving on to talk about interdisciplinary thinking, we're trying to go beyond the confines of the law school and the medical school. And also when we think of reaching out to the public, um, tradi traditionally, uh, perhaps medical practitioners or legal practitioners, they may have a kind of um, paternalistic view. That is, they try to get the best of their knowledge and try to educate the public. But instead for our project, we try to take a more participatory approach. We think that the public are like partners to us. We can draw on insights and also we can exchange ideas rather than being uh, in a essentially top-down approach. So um, furthermore, uh, in uh, alluding to our theme of public legal education, we think that it's important to focus on promoting access to justice as well, because we tend to find that the public, they may not necessarily be interested in law only when they are being confronted with uh, typical legal issues or problems. Instead, they may be expressing an interest over some recent topics, even if it doesn't really personally relate to their own circumstances. So um, in order to take on a participatory approach, we try to reach out to the public during our research synthesis, as well as dissemination phrases. So um, talking about the research phrase, we try to formulate our research topics based on the actual needs and interests of the patient, as well as the general public. And so, and also the topics are related to some recent societal and technological developments. For instance, uh, maybe uh, everyone would have known something about patient consent and uh, how to be uh, assured that the patient is voluntary in expressing his or her consent. But instead it can intersect with some recent technological development, such as the growing use of telemedicine. Telemedicine refers to um, the process by which doctors can try to use some social medias, such as phone or emails or like um, Facebook and WhatsApp, and they try to diagnose and offer treatment to the patient. So it shows how um, technological in development can intersect with traditional legal and medical concepts. And also another um, growing area of interest is towards surrogacy. As we can uh, note, we have some uh, recent productions such as The Nest on uh, View TV, as well as uh, Mimi on, on the Netflix. And also we have the recent case of Elton John, a celebrity who has paid several children run through the surrogacy arrangements. 
And then moving on to the synthesis part, we can try to consider how our research topic on medical law can interact with different areas of law and medical education. For instance, when we are talking about medical records and confidentiality, uh, apart from focusing on the code of conduct from the medical council, we can also co reconsider the traditional doctor-patient paradigm. Is it essentially one of a top-down approach or rather can we try to have a more level playing field between the two parties? And also we can move on to the uh, uh, privacy law, such as the PDPO, which pres uh, prescribes some time frame for the medical practitioners to respond to the request for access of information by the patients. And also for the topic of surrogacy that I just mentioned, we can also see the interaction of different areas of law. For instance, uh, we can touch on medical technology, such as uh, the IVF uh, reproduction technology, and also it could be related to contract law as in we have some gestational carrier agreement and we can see whether we can adopt a con uh, contractual approach to diagnose the problem. And also it could touch on immigration and private international law issues for, uh, such as the recent uh, parentage and surrogacy project of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. And also interestingly, it could touch on the recent warfare and COVID-19 because um, unknown, uh, probably not uh, not well aware uh, aware of by most people. Ukraine and Russia are becoming uh, one most one of the most popular uh, reproductive hubs in the recent years until the recent warfare. So it could, we could see how recent developments could intersect with the area of medical law as well. And lastly, moving on to the dissemination approach, we try to think from the perspective of the public and we try to disseminate our findings and information through radio interviews and our website. And also in our website short and our short articles, we try to use Q&A and we use bilingualism charges, uh, charts and diagrams to illustrate our findings. Okay, just to quickly wrap up, so for the future, we plan to uh, continue on what we've done. So to the research seminars, also to start uh, keep to develop our website as as we including more uh, articles on it, and new ways to promote our website. And of course, finally, our goal is public outreach. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Arthur. Thank you very much, Vanessa and Christine. We have sort of run out of time, but I've got I've got one question that's come in. From Shmuel, I don't know if you can answer this quick, very relatively quickly. Uh, so Shmuel Yerushalmi has asked, um, how do you think correct and effective legal education can support the development and improvement of public public medical services? I think it's quite a big question in a way, isn't it? Well, can we get back to this at the end? Yes, we'll try and leave time for it. A very quick one, if I can ask, is um, you said you've got the website, you said you've got your videos up there and you want to, to, to outreach for them. Um, can people, can you get feedback via the website on what people are thinking or what they would like you to actually provide? Yes. Or should we leave that for the end as well? You can yeah, I, I, yeah, we can, we will welcome feedback and we will can see a comment columns for people. And I have been receiving, um, questions from my fellow students, not students, so my friend classmate as well. Okay, okay, good. All right, then we better move on to the next speakers anyway, as we're Thank coming you. to the end. So uh, our next speaker is, well, we, we have two speakers for the next uh, presentation. We have uh, Dr. Vandana Singh. Uh, um, Dr. Singh is an assistant professor of law at the um, University School of Law and Legal Studies at Guru Gobind Singh Intraprastra uh, University in Delhi. Um, and Dr. Dr. Singh holds multiple degrees from the University of Delhi, uh, is also widely published as well. Her areas of specialization are intellectual property rights, alternative dispute resolution, private international law and consumer law. And she'll be speaking with Ms. Shivani Lahoti. And uh, Ms. Lahoti is currently pursuing her PhD uh, from uh, the same law school. Um, and uh, before that, she was associated with the Amity Law School in Delhi as well. Um, she completed her master's from National Law University in Jopur uh, with her area of spe specialization as intellectual property rights. 
so if I can hand over to uh, Ms. Ms. Shivani Lahoti and Dr. Singh as well. Thank you. Greetings from India, everyone. Um, good evening to one and all present. I hope I'm audible. You are, yes, and we can see your slides. Uh, so is my presentation visible? Yeah, we can see your slides. They look all great. Right. Okay. So um, I'm Shivani Lahoti, and uh, I'll be presenting a paper on um, educational reforms for effective legal teaching in India on behalf of my PhD supervisor, Dr. Vandana Singh, and myself. Uh, so the core objective of this paper is to analyze the current norms governing the legal academia in India and accordingly suggest reforms to improve the standard thereof. So I think we can all agree that the standard of legal academia has a direct bearing on the standard of legal education, which further uh, determines the standard of the legal profession. Now, this holds true for any other discipline or profession as well. And thus, it is something which uh, demands to be paid careful consideration to. Now, before, uh, so immediately after this, I'll uh, you know, walk you through a few issues uh, with the legal academy, uh, academia in India. So uh, Professor N.R. Madhav Menon, uh, the father of modern legal education in India, wrote a blue paper in 2012 titled The Transformation of Legal Education in India. Uh, he mentioned therein that there's a paucity of competent teachers to guide a growing body of law students. And um, along with this, there are some other issues that he also highlighted in the paper, which remain true um, to this day. So bright law graduates um, do not join postgraduate studies in India, uh, in Indian law schools, uh, in, uh, to be precise, uh, nor are they attracted to teaching and uh, research positions in them. Many of them uh, migrate to the US and UK for LLM and either do not return to India or uh, even if they do return, they do not take up teaching positions in Indian universities. Now, the Bar Association of India and the Indian Society for Law Firms came forward to address uh, the shortage of teachers uh, to send senior advocates to act as adjunct faculty in selected law schools. Some law schools have even started recruiting uh, teachers from outside India, paying them attractive uh, service conditions distinct from the rest. And others are entering into exchange arrangements under uh, which students and teachers are provided uh, opportunities to learn uh, in different environments under credit transfer arrangements. So everyone now realizes basically that the uh, future of, uh, uh, the future would remain like this and the position would appear to be a bleak one until and unless there is done, something is done to improve the position of faculty. And uh, if this continues, if things continue to be this way, then students with financial capacities will migrate to other jurisdictions for their higher education. Now, there was another issue that Professor Menon highlighted in this paper, which is uh, that, which is the corporate law inclined curriculum of national law schools. So uh, the bar and the bench in India have repeatedly made a complaint against national law schools. Uh, that is that the curriculum designed by them is such um, that the predominant focus is to supply uh, trained graduates for corporate jobs, legal and managerial. Now, corporate opportunities have proved to be an attractive comfort zone for most law graduates, and more and more uh, bright graduates join the corporate bar each year. In such a scenario, one has to provide incentives that could make um, full-time teaching come across as a lucrative option to a significant number of these graduates. Now, uh, most institutions imparting legal education in India, with the meager pay packages that they have to offer, have been unable to attract good full-time faculty uh, or on board. So since most colleges operate with profit being the, the sole or the predominant motive, um, they do not end up investing much uh, in the faculty uh, uh, you know, uh, that they have. So uh, these were some of the issues uh, uh, that I wanted to highlight. Uh, in my next slide, I have talked about the norms, uh, uh, the prerequisites or the qualifications that one need to possess for um, entering the legal academia in India on a full-time basis. Uh, 
So legal education um, and legal academia by that uh, connection in India is jointly regulated by two bodies. Firstly, the Bar Council of India, the BCI, and University Grants Commission, the UGC. While the UGC is supposed to uh, determine and maintain the standards of university education overall, the BCI has the statutory function of promoting legal education and laying down standards in consultation with universities and state bar councils. The BCI visits and inspects law colleges and universities in the country as part of that function. Now coming over to the prerequisites for entering the legal academia as a full-time legal uh, educator or law professor, the bare minimum academic qualification that is required as of today is an LLM or master's degree. This means that if a person is simply a law graduate, uh, that is, uh, if the only degrees that they have is either an LLB or uh, a BA LLB uh, or any equivalent five-year integrated program degree, they will not be eligible to be recruited to the post of an assistant professor at any law college or university in India. The post of assistant professor, as we know, is the uh, lowest in the hierarchy um, um, of positions of university educators and it is followed by associate professor, then ultimately professor. Now, um, in many, um, in, in fact, these graduates, uh, they can, however, uh, join the bar, uh, start their legal practice, and simultaneously keep teaching as part-time faculty members. In fact, many um, uh, practicing advocates deliver lectures to law students alongside, uh, you know, uh, carrying their uh, practice. But this does not count as teaching experience in the eyes of the UGC. So on top of holding a, uh, on, on of holding a master's degree, um, an aspiring law teacher or any um, aspiring university teacher for that matter has to qualify uh, the highly competitive uh, multiple choice based um, examination called the National Eligibility Test. Um, which is conducted under the aegis of the UGC. Now, although one of the two segments of this examination attempts to test the candidate's research and teaching aptitude, in my humble opinion, the same is not, uh, is certainly not a foolproof method of ascertaining or ensuring that the candidate in question uh, actually possesses the traits that are expected of any competent law teacher. So, uh, the other uh, our segment of this examination uh, tests the candidates' uh, knowledge in their area of specialization or expertise, which in our case is law. Now, qualifying this exam makes one eligible for recruitment to the post of assistant professor at any law college or university. There are some institutions that are not very rigid about this particular requirement and hire and recruit candidates that have not yet qualified the national eligibility test or any uh, equivalent examination. But then such institutions are in the minority. And uh, even if they do recruit such candidates, there is always the issue of disparity uh, in remuneration between the net qualified candidates and the non-net teachers. Now, back in 2018, the UGC, that is the University Grants uh, Commission, uh, added another uh, prerequisite uh, to, uh, for uh, uh, entering the legal academia in India. That is, they introduced another prerequisite, which is uh, they made, uh, within its 2018 regulations, they made uh, a PhD degree mandatory for direct recruitment to the post of assistant professor. And by this, they raised the bar uh, for simply entering the academic profession and not just climbing up the ladder, uh, you know, in terms of getting promoted. So uh, this was supposed to come in application from um, July 1st, 2021, but keeping the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because of, uh, in view of the COVID-19 pandemic, the applicability of uh, this new requirement was postponed to July 1st, 2023. Now, uh, I have some arguments to make, uh, which go against, like which are not in favor of making PhD mandatory. So when this uh, announcement was made, uh, it received a lot of mixed responses from various stakeholders. Some praised it for the positive impact it would have on the quality of faculty and research culture at law schools and universities in India. Uh, the ones who were not very comfortable with this decision in the least were aspiring law teachers 
and people who had uh, although who had entered the profession successfully uh, were yet to enroll themselves in a phd program or were not likely uh, to get their degree before 1st july 2023 now this would have meant a great deal of hardship for them as far as employment or a change of job was concerned for those who were yet to enter the profession um this was a discouraging development for many as this made the process uh, much more cumbersome and time consuming for in addition to qualifying the highly competitive net examination the aspirant would now be expected to have a phd degree in hand before they could even start teaching university students on a full time basis the minimum duration of a phd program in india at present is 2 years excluding uh, the period of coursework and the maximum is 6 years one can well imagine uh, the reasons why the decision of the ugc um making phd mandatory received a lot of criticism for it had the potential effect of discouraging uh, a lot of young talented individuals from um entering the uh, the teaching profession or uh, let's just say in other words from pursuing the academic path on a full time basis now at the root of this um uh, uh this decision to make phd mandatory lies uh, the perception that a research degree equips an individual with the skill set uh that is indispensable for teaching however uh being a good researcher is not is only one of the many skills that are required uh for teaching or or that are required for uh, somebody to be an able law teacher um communication and leadership being two other such skills so being a good researcher doesn't automatically make one an able or competent law teacher and vice versa thus by giving so much importance to one of the skills uh, one of these skills to an extent that it deters uh, people from entering the profession um uh, does not make this decision of the ugc a very wise uh, uh, a move in in my humble opinion now uh, also um, making phd um uh, a matter of compulsion than interest runs the inevitable risk of it becoming just a compliance tool uh, this will not just lead to a mechanical and procedural approach to obtaining a phd it will also lead to an increased competition for a very limited number of phd seats there will be a mad rush which uh, will definitely detrimentally affect the interests of those who are genuinely interested in pursuing a phd and not just who are, who are not going to pursue a phd just for the sake of it so moreover it would also uh, be uh, unfair and erroneous to project uh, that phd uh, is the be all and end all of all research in fact a significantly large body of research uh, is also carried outside doctoral research pro- projects both by faculty members and others and faculty members hence have ample opportunities to find or create avenues for research even after their recruitment should they so be interested now i would also like to share uh, another uh, a landmark development in the field of legal education in india so in 2021 the bar council of india established the indian institute of law in the state of odisha through its trust um and this institute is supposed to be the first of its kind uh, institution um in india meant primarily for the continuous legal education or as it is also known the continuous professional development of uh, young faculty members and advocates in india now the bca trust had uh, earlier also established the national law school of india university bangalore in 1986 uh a pioneer in the field of legal education and the first national law school in india which remains the best institution for imparting legal education in the country even today after almost more than 3 decades of its uh, existence now an institute such as the indian institute of law supports the proposition that learning is a lifelong process and when it comes to something that is as dynamic in nature as law is uh, one has to keep updating themselves in order for them to teach well just like students in turn with advocates in law firms to uh, get training in the practical aspects of law uh, a similar however tailored system should be in place for law teachers as well now in another attempt uh, 
to improve the standards of legal education, uh, uh, legal research and quality uh, the, uh, uh, of the law faculty in the country. The Bar Council of India in January 2021 also took another decision and it decided to scrap the one year LLM program in India, as in their view, it had become more of an ornamental uh, degree and one year was not a sufficient period for uh, uh, someone to develop research skills and specialize in a particular uh, branch of law. The two year program was considered to be the more appropriate choice of the two. And this decision, however, was challenged uh, in the Supreme Court of India and the matter is yet to be disposed of. Now coming over to my final slide in the last segment of my presentation, uh, which is all about suggestions and recommendations from my end. So some of the reforms uh, that could be brought about by the UGC and or BCI to improve the standard of legal academia and by extension legal education in India uh, are as follows. So first of all, uh, a PhD degree should not be made a criterion for entry into the profession for reasons that I've discussed earlier. It can continue to remain a criterion for promotion though. Uh, instead, uh, I would suggest that a certain kind and number of publications of scholarly works and or teaching experiences or other professional experiences can be made the entry level criteria. Secondly, um, chalk and talk uh, remains or the lecture method remains the predominant method of instruction in most uh, law schools in India, even today. So a system of mandatory training in legal pedagogy and research uh, should be introduced for law teachers all across the country, especially before they embark on their teaching careers. Thirdly, um, so in law schools in the US, uh, two distinct categories of uh, faculty are recruited, clinical and academic. Clinical faculty are those that uh, instruct uh, students and monitor their work uh, on cases with actual clients. So if a similar system is executed in India, it will certainly redefine uh, legal education in India and also um, help facilitate Professor um, Madhav Menon's vision of clinical legal education in the country. Fourthly, um, Irrespective of the amount of knowledge that some visiting faculty might have to offer as being experts in their respective domains, uh, they can never be a substitute, in my opinion, for full-time faculty in legal education. Uh, it must be ensured that employer institutions, uh, government or private, make appropriate investment in the recruitment and professional development um, by means such as remuneration in accordance with uh, UGC norms or the Seventh Pay Commission, then timely promotions for deserving candidates, mandatory reimbursements of expenses incurred in participation in academic events up to a certain uh, level, etc. So these are some of the investments that uh, institutions could make in the faculty that they have on board. And faculty shouldn't be um, burdened with administrative work to an extent that it leaves them with insufficient time uh, to invest in their core functions of teaching and research. Now, um, another uh, uh, suggestion and the last one is that when it comes to the performance-based uh, appraisal system uh, that we have in place for evaluating the performance of uh, law teachers, uh, the student, the component of student feedback uh, should be given as much importance as is given to uh, the number of publications and other academic pursuits. This may, this is not the reality in most law schools in India. So this is something that needs to be worked upon. Now, um, to sum up my presentation, I would like to say that a student's decision to pursue a career in academics uh, can be greatly influenced by the kind of teachers uh, they had as they got to learn from as students. Now, their job satisfaction and uh, the level of motivation uh, of these teachers, it gets reflected in their performance and the enthusiasm with which they teach and do their uh, other discharge their other responsibilities. Thus, reforms have to be brought about uh, such that the positive experiences of the present lot of teachers um, is uh, acts as an encouraging factor and can attract more and more brilliant minds to this noble profession of teaching law. Um, that would be all from my end. That was my time. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ms. Lahoti, and uh, thank you for keeping to time exactly. So 
that was great and also such an interesting uh presentation and i think a lot of the issues you raise and the observations you make they're not just limited to india um i think in particular i like that point you make about why anyone would think that a phd would give you the skill sets to be a teacher um yeah. it just it just doesn't make sense i know there's that obsession in many jurisdictions now uh, but uh, well just can you clarify one thing for me um what about practitioners then do practitioners go into teaching law in in india they do but only as part time faculty okay okay well i um, i mean i i think maybe we benefit well i'm not sure if things have changed in the uk now but when i was there many practitioners would go into teaching as well and of course uh, i've got here with me many practitioners who uh, also teach in hong kong with us as well um right. you know being a practitioner doesn't mean you've got the skill sets to teach but right. being uh, uh, focused on research definitely doesn't mean you you have the the skill sets to teach as well um we had a question coming in from uh, uh, one of our old colleagues uh, uh, esther who wants to know um you know that the national eligibility test stroke phd may not test the attributes of a competent teacher uh, what from your perspective would be key competencies for teachers in india and esther is now put her camera on you can see her there she said that you did mention leadership and communication but what sort of things do you think are the key competencies for teachers in india so uh, if if i'm i just want to um, ensure that i've understood the question correctly so miss esther is asking me if uh, uh like the the qualities that in my opinion form the key competence competencies of teachers in india yes i'm okay. sorry i didn't express it well yes sir. okay so um so i myself uh, taught at a law school for 3 years before i pursued my uh, started with my uh, phd uh, under my supervisor so these are the skills um that i saw uh, uh, come in handy and something which uh, if the teacher does not possess students are very um, quick to make that out so uh, so like sound knowledge of the subject that is one uh, being aware of the latest judgments and latest developments uh, uh, in that field is another because if the student is more well read than you are then that is something where they start to lose a little bit of respect for you because they expect you to be one step ahead of you always so that is one so you have to constantly constantly read and keep yourself updated uh with uh, the latest developments so that is one um then uh you have to be you you just don't have to be uh, an expert in the subject that you're teaching but you need to have a significant amount of interpersonal communication skills because there are a lot of things that happen in a classroom which have got nothing to do with law or the subject that is being taught so you need to handle them and these are certain things which can make or break your image in front of the student so um this is something which should be taught to all teachers and all teachers irrespective of whatever subject they are teaching um should undergo training in that particular uh, uh area they should have a very sound understanding of student psychology as well so uh, this yes. is what i have shivani i would also like to add uh, a good good afternoon everyone um uh, i am co author with dr uh, uh, with dr shivani lahoti uh, i would just like to add one thing in this question that actually in india in most of the law school the teacher and his students they grow together it's not that we are teaching and students they are taking everything sometime you know students also they are having so many updated knowledge and they are having so many uh, updated information so we learn together we are also students at the end so i don't think it's only with india but uh, it's around the world we all read together we all grow together that is something which i would like to add thank you thank you very much dr singh and thank you very much ms lahoti we have got some more questions but i think we're probably out of time at the moment but you're quite right i think the the the, the comments you just made there they transfer to to other subjects and of course to other jurisdictions as well okay so now uh, the final presentation uh, unfortunately is me um so i will upload my slides and i will try and be as quick as i can in going through this um i suppose 
from a teaching point of view, this isn't a great slide anyway. I think that's the starting point, isn't it, really? With that sort of blurred uh, lettering on that background. Um, but what I wanted to talk about this evening is um, a project that I've been working on for a number of years uh, with other um, ex-students as well, uh, which is the development of a course to introduce high school students to the study of law using superhero films. Um, it's uh, the idea originally was to develop this what we call a transitional course to assist students before they come to university to study law um, if they if they want to come there or, or maybe even sort of try to tempt them into studying law as well. Um, it comes about because of support from CUHK in the teaching development learning enhancement grant and of course a development grant as well. Um, the reason for the course of course is if any of you have seen any of these superhero films, um, they are wonderful for providing scenarios of lots of different things happening where there are lots of many, many different um, legal issues that arise. So I won't show you the clip here because we'll probably break down. But if you if some of you have seen any of the Avengers films or whatever else, you'll know that in saving the universe, in saving the world, these superheroes, there's often a lot of damage to both people and, of course, property and lots of other issues that arise as well. So that's the idea behind the course. Why did it come about? The original idea for the project was given to me by a local legal practitioner who um, I met at a Law Society dinner one evening where she was explaining to me that she liked all of the face-to-face the -face seminars that we were organizing at the time and she enjoyed them, but couldn't we do something on a bit, a bit more of a sort of a fun topic? And she suggested some of the superhero films as well. So that sort of stuck in the back of my head and I thought maybe in the future something and then for a number of years I've been teaching on different programs that CUHK provide for high school students including their gifted student program and their summer institute so I was teaching on uh, uh, the gifted student program it was a course that I devised called future law which was all about law's interaction with technology and the ethics and issues that arose there and my teaching assistant was um, uh, a psychology and law student uh, Raymond uh, Ho and while we were doing this, and, and he was working very much with me in delivering the course, he just suggested, look, we're, we're trying to explain various issues. Why don't we show some clips from some of the superhero films as well? So that gave me the idea, OK, it's time to try and plan something. So I decided to plan it for CUHK's Summer Institute. There is a Summer Institute every year at uh, CUHK for high school students. They can come along and choose courses to study in various different disciplines. I should also mention that there is a book, by the way, that Raymond recommended to me called The Law of Superheroes. It's published by some American uh, academics, lawyers, uh, and it's a great book, but my course is different, I would suggest. And from the start, I didn't like the, uh, the title. The Law of Superheroes would suggest that there is a special law for superheroes. And there are very few laws that just apply to superheroes. Um, the law applies to everyone. So, um, we started it as a CUH Summer Institute course uh, back in 2020. Um, I was really looking forward to delivering this, and of course that was the year of COVID, so we had to go online. Uh, it was definitely designed as a taster for law study. The format was six days of one, two and a half hour online session. I had about 25 um, high school students, I think, for the first iteration, and it developed over the iteration, of course, because the usual thing with these courses, the students get very engaged, the students um, then ask questions, ask about different films that I've not even considered and raise other issues for us to, to develop. And that's why we could sort of further develop the, uh, the course. I then thought about actually developing this for the law school as a tr transitional law course. The big thinking behind that, of course, is that the, the problems with the traditional way of teaching law, or at least my ideas of the problems for teaching law, the first is, engagement of students. And that seems to be a, a general problem, I think, uh, in many law schools around the world, engaging students. And we've been talking for the last two days about many ways of trying to engage students. What I noted was that when I was teaching high school students, they were super engaged. Um, they were really interested. And then by the time I got to talk, teach the, uh, the LLB students in particular, um, which would be in the usually the, the second year, originally it had been in the fourth year, I found that perhaps their engagement wasn't as much. And I did wonder why, what, what happened in studying law at times that, that sort of killed that enthusiasm that I'd seen with the high school students. Um, so that was, that was one issue. 
I started to think about this and I think it was the, we teach law in a very strange manner. We teach law in segments. And of course, you know, anyone who's practiced in law will know that law, you, know, you don't just have a, a, an issue to do with contract at times. There will be other issues as well. You don't just have uh, uh, perhaps a, a civil law issue. There will be criminal law issues as well. There'll be many different levels. When, when Arthur and, uh, and his team were talking earlier about the issues to do with medicine and public law, well, of course, there are many different interconnected issues as well. But we teach law in segments. We start off by teaching the law to the students in segments, and then we, we hope by the end of their degrees, they put it all together, and it just seemed the wrong way around. So I thought about trying to put everything together at the beginning, and then try to break it down in the introduction. So the idea was, um, based upon that idea of lack of engagement, just expanding, um, I've looked into the literature, Maronville's famous quote there, many law students are so bored by the second year that their attendance, preparation and participation decline precipitously. Um, you know, in England, when I used to have this happen, I would suggest to students who came to see me after a year or two years of studying a law degree, when they said, I don't like law, I'd say, great, why don't you go and study something else? What do you like? Journalism, history? whatever you want to, yeah, we'll, we'll help you move over. But when I came to Hong Kong, it doesn't work like that here. Um, it seemed to be such a privilege if you get to study law that it, it's almost bizarre if anyone does change their mind, especially in our undergraduates. So the university finds it very strange when we actually get an undergraduate that perhaps wants to change disciplines. It's usually people coming from other disciplines trying to get into law. So um, I wanted to try and think about engagement and the films well, films have often been used, of course, to engage students, but the superhero films, as I said, I think they're, they're ideal because they offer such variety of circumstances. And they also fit in with the concept of problem based learning as well, putting a problem to the students to begin with and getting them to identify the issues and the law as well. Also, as I said, the traditional method and form of teaching law, I think, is always a bizarre idea. You break things down into, into particular topics here, learn some contract, then later learn some talk then learn some equity or learn some property laws. And you think, well, well, these things, at one point the students start to say, but, but we're repeating things that we did in the first year. And they often think this is, a, this is bizarre and it's wrong. Um, of course, we try to say, well, yes, because these things are interconnected, but, but they haven't got the idea from the beginning. And I think that's an, an issue. Law is always considered a difficult subject, as it says there, there are always complaints about the, the workload. Um, every year when I have to go and uh, uh, talk to the university about the exit uh, surveys. Uh, the university asked me why students always say, you know, law students are always the ones who complain about their workload the most. And I have to explain, well, I'm afraid that's the nature of law. Um, the solutions, of course, would be to try and engage students, to try and get them more involved in the work. Something like flipped classrooms, problem based learning. They're, I think they would be useful things to use, but there are problems in implementing these. And of course, again, planning these, um, there are problems as well. So some of the problems with these new teaching methods, particularly for law schools that have been established for a while, and even though we're relatively new, I would still say we would have these problems. Problem-based learning, flipped classrooms, they require a lot more work. Um, and um, traditionally, minded law schools and teachers generally don't want to change. Problem-based learning in particular, I think you really, I think, need to change the whole program, and everyone has to go over to that. And it's very difficult then to sort of retrofit that, as it says there. For me, the superhero films work uh, because they are, um, as it says there, contemporary in contact and media. Many students are already familiar with the stories. You don't have to be familiar to, to actually do the courses. Um, so the students are already engaged at time. And again, it's true, isn't it? If you're enjoying something, if you're engaged with something, it doesn't feel so much like work. They do cover so many issues. Um, and of course, they save me a lot of time. I don't have to write scenarios. Um, I can just use clips from films and then ask the students to try and identify what the issues are and then try and think what the law is or even what the law should be as well, which is, is quite a nice thing to do with them as well. I think these sorts of courses, the, the idea of using this sort of for, uh, a film as well could be used for taster courses, transitional courses, standard courses, and even capstone courses. We're encouraged to have these capstone courses now at universities and we tend to have things like research essays or whatever else well actually putting together a uh, as some sort of big problem scenario where students could actually perhaps come in and discuss that with us and show that 
that they bring together everything they've learned over the four years of their law degree, a film clip or film clips could be used in that way. And I think they would work quite well. Continuing professional development for lawyers. Um, I've already used that. I've already used superhero, uh, superhero law uh, things for CPD courses with, bar sorry, with solicitors in Hong Kong. Barristers are about to do uh, CPD, I believe, as well. And the other one, of course, would be for outreach, for, for going out to people who are not lawyers, perhaps even a MOOC at some point in the future. So um, let me just click on, because I know I'm running out of time. Um, the films are great because there are so many issues. You've got lots of things to do with, with, with uh, discrimination, with diversity in various different ways. We've seen whitewashing in some of the Marvel films, which of course raises issues about uh, how the issues are actually produced as well. We've got new issues with the new Shang-Chi Chi film where they changed some of the stories there, which has raised other issues that I'm going to discuss with the students. And we can even get down to simple things like intellectual property rights as well. Of course, when we're talking about using these films, when we're talking about uh, the original comics as well, um, the organisations that now own them, in particular Disney, of course, are very well noted for their intellectual property uh, protection as well. Um, there are also issues that we brought in to do with things like automated weapons, using things from the Guardians of the Galaxy as well. So, as I said, I think there are lots of different issues. So far, all I've used them for is the Summer Institute uh, and those introductions for high school students. The, um, and the CPD as well. Um, the, the grants themselves, I should say, um, thank you to CHK for giving me the grants. What did I use them for? I used them to hire a, a research assistant, a recent law graduate, the anchor, who helped me a lot because she was a recent law graduate, because I could say to her, what was wrong uh, when you were studying? And what would you have liked? What sort of help would you have liked as well? Um, she was very much responsible for the development of the materials we've got. We've also got our own animations as well, because we were a little bit worried about intellectual property issues as well. We decided that we'd have our own in, in, in animations dealing with certain uh, topics. So we developed um, six films as well to be used. The Summer Institute, I'll be teaching that again uh, next month, and uh, it will be the third year of teaching it. I've got a lot of feedback from the students. It's mostly been positive. Uh, I think I should write it up, and after Chris's presentation earlier, maybe I'll, I'll try and write it up for something like the law teacher. Hopefully they'll be interested. Um, and again, we'll be running it in the same way. I just got the email this week. I was hoping to go to face to face, but it will be online. Um, the CPD sessions, I've now done, I think, three CPD seminars for solicitors in Hong Kong, three hour long. Uh, of course, it's a very different sort of thing from doing the, um, the introductory uh, sessions for these um, high school students, but it seems to work quite well. Um, maybe it's because the solicitors all think that they're superheroes, so they like the idea of, uh, of coming along to a session on superheroes, but it's, it's definitely got a lot of conversations going about, again, that idea of what the law is, and even with the solicitors in Hong Kong, what the law should be. So I am hoping at one point to roll out a transitional course. The main problem there is convincing the faculty that we should have a traditional course. The materials are almost finished there for it. I again think it would be useful to use something like this as a capstone course or a capstone assessment as well. And I have talked to the university about in the future developing a massive open online course for this as well. There are some problems. Some colleagues I've uh, chatted to think that this is all a joke. Um, the idea of using superhero films is just a joke in itself, which, OK, they're entitled to their opinions. Um, but the positives, as I said, have been the student report response. And of course, also, when I've talked about this with colleagues in other jurisdictions and other disciplines, I found people in other disciplines saying, well, we, we've been thinking about doing this as well. And so we've talked about sharing materials as well. Um, there are very few, by the way, transitional courses for law. The idea of actually taking people who want to study law and trying to help them getting into study law. Most of them focus on, as it says there, legal writing. And I think just a general introduction to law would really help. I was hoping to do it perhaps for our JD in the future as well. And having JD graduates there, maybe they've got opinions on this. There are various references to some of the points I made there. I will just uh, mention the people who've been involved. As I said, Bianca was a, a former JD student who worked as a research assistant and developed the films and the materials with our colleagues in the ITSC here and the video unit. Uh, Raymond, who of course worked with me on the gifted program, uh, a couple of times and was really good and enthusiastic and had lots of ideas. And an English student, Natalie Whittam, who came over from Oxford at one point and did some work on this same project. 
Also, um, CUHK's CLEAR and our ITSC have been very helpful as well. If anyone is interested in this project, by the way, and um, would like to discuss, or if you'd like the materials, because um, I don't think there should be any proprietary, proprietary uh, interest in this. I'm very happy to share any materials if anyone is thinking of doing something similar or use them in any way. Um, thank you very much. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have already come in. Um, <laughs> uh, Mick Fisher, my colleague Mick, has said, is it a problem that presumably many of the audience will know more about the genre than I will? Well, the sad thing, Mick, is that when I was young, I was addicted to Marvel comics. So I sort of got that. But of course, I had to catch up with the films. So I've had uh, great fun watching the films, by the way. So, um, but, but yeah, you are right. Actually, it's, it's not a problem. It's been good. On the first iteration, one of the students at one point said to me, what about vampires? What about Blade, a vampire killer? And, and I, I'd forgotten that Blade was a, a Marvel character and that there were these films about Blade. And of course, we could then go off and talk about, you know, can you kill someone who is undead? You know, would it be murder? Is it murder for a vampire to kill someone because they're undead themselves? And usually it has to be a human. All of these different issues that we got into. So that was quite good. Uh, Shmuel was sent in um, with films with the Avenger hero scene supporting development, learning and professional skills in other disciplines beyond legal studies. Yeah, I've already spoken to people in, in other disciplines who've been talking about using these films as well. Um, some of the social sciences, obviously, there would be uh, interesting issues uh, that rise there that they can bring in. Um, again, you know, th things to do with even, even trauma that's portrayed in some of these films as well, I think could be useful in uh, some of the, uh, the medical discussions as well. So I think that's the end of the questions, which is good. I don't know if anyone else has got any questions, any other questions on that. My email is there, by the way, if anyone does want to talk about this or about any of the materials, if they are interested. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much. I don't know if, I think we've got a, I think we've got, just a minute or two left so i don't know if arthur and your team do you want to come back on that earlier question yes we can we believe yeah we believe that legal education can improve the uh, public health service i wish the patients and doctor relationship um patients uh they're aware of their own rights and while the doctors are aware of their own obligations and these uh this intrinsic relationship will benefit the um, uh, when when they go to see the doctors and the doctors know what they know and what the patients know, and to avoid um, medical negligence and also improve the uh, provide uh, provision of public uh, public health services. At the same time, on the other hand, um, uh, the policy of the public health measure can be judicially reviewed and. This um this uh this is a good way for a check and balance. So I, I believe that legal education on um, on the public or on other uh, professional can increase the uh, public health service. Great, thank you very much. So that was in answer to Schmuel's question earlier. Um, there was another question for Miss Lahoti. I don't know if Miss Lahoti is still here. Um, Okay, maybe maybe not there. I think we're just waiting now for Michael to come along to give the final uh, comments. Um, and again, I'm not sure if the other session has actually ended on time yet. Yeah, we've got the final comments coming. So we'll wait for Michael to come in. In the meantime, let me just say again, thank you to all of our speakers in this session, except for me. Um, and so thank you for um, Arthur, uh, Vanessa and Christine uh, for telling us about your project with Medic Law. Uh, thank you for Dr. Singh and Ms. Lahoti for that great, very interesting uh, um, presentation, which rang lots of bells with me. Um, as you may guess, I haven't got a PhD, and um, I'm, I'm very grateful that the two times I was certain I was going to do a PhD, I luckily met very clever people who talked me out of it and just said, write the book, which I still think is possibly the best advice. Uh, so it was interesting to hear about those developments in India. Thank you.